What's going on, everybody? This is the Uncanny Omar from Near Mint Condition, the home of Collected Editions, and I've got with me... The Astonishing Melanie, and join us as we do an overview of these Collected Editions from Dark Horse. Stay tuned. Thank you to Dark Horse for sending us these Collected Editions to show to you fine minties, and all of these are already published, so... Uh, let's start off with Edgeworld, Uncanny Omar. Yes, so I'm going to be talking about Edgeworld. Uh, Astonishing Melanie's joining me to talk about these Vampire Hunter D novels since she's such a huge fan. Uh, but in the description of the video, we do have timestamps if you want to jump around to a specific series in case you don't want to be spoiled. But before even doing that, smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. All right, now let's get started. That's right, the very first book we're going to be talking about today, or we, I mean me, is Edgeworld. This is called Season 1, A Little Chaos in Your Life. Now, this was a Comixology exclusive, and it was recently printed by Dark Horse. Now, this right here is written by Chuck Austin. It is drawn by Patrick O'Leaf. And here's all the other contributors to the book. Big Stringer Horn. I love that name. He's the editor. Here's the origin of Edgewood, or Edge World. sorry. You'll see why I called it Edgewood here in a second. Written by Chuck Austin. Now, before I go into this, I have on my channel, like a lot of people, talked about Chuck Austin's run on X-Men and Justice League. Now, whenever I'm reading something by a new writer, whether it be somebody that I haven't liked their previous work, I go into it with a clean slate all right well let's see what they got to offer chuck austin has been gone from the comic book industry for well over a decade and he's worked in animation he's worked in television and now he's back so i was like okay let's check out what he's got I, that's why i was really curious about this and i'm just judging it on what i read here this was a lot of fun this reminded me of deadwood hence the name edgewood whack what i called it and it's purposely done so it's like firefly it's like mandalorian you have a Western set in space. That's really it. So it starts off with this mystery. Uh, we have this character right here of Washaksa that shows up in this soothsayer's place. She's like a mystic. And she's given him visions because he's looking for somebody in particular. And you can find out who that somebody is by reading this. So he starts to see this life of this young guy named Killian. And Killian Jess, who we're going to learn more about here in a second. Now she starts giving him visions of him as an older man. And during this time as an older man, he's a magistrate of this particular place right here. This is Palin. So he lives here and he's a magistrate. And a magistrate is not like a sheriff. He's not like a lawman. But he does take justice into his own hand, almost like Judge Dredd. So this does feel like the Wild Wild West, not the Will Smith version, but the original Wild Wild West. Now, one thing you're probably seeing is there's a lot of violence because we are talking about the West up in space. Ah, there's also sexual content, so this is definitely for mature readers. Now, we also meet the character of Chila, who plays an important part through here. And it's interesting because we have a couple of mysteries, right? Like, why... Is this guy getting visions of this particular character, Killian? And what exactly is he looking for? And is he finally going to be able to find it? How long ago did this take place? Are they even in the same location? So I like that. I like that it's not really spelled out for you. Uh, and I like the character of Killian. He has a really heartbreaking story that happens as you see through a series of flashbacks. Or I guess through a series of flashbacks for this character of Washoon. Now, uh, there's also the character of Chila and... That's this character right here, who's a native of this planet right here, Palin. Now, it's inhabited by a bunch of monsters. There's it looks like it was in the aftermath of a big military occupation. And monsters as in aliens. So this is like the aftermath of a huge alien invasion. And I like the dynamic between these characters. Like, she has a father here, but you'll see what happens. Um, I, I, I mentioned mature content in this one, and it definitely is so. But this one does have a lot of heart, and it feels like Chuck Austin is coming back and, you know, wants to distance himself from his previous work. Because it does read different. It almost really reads like a script of a first few episodes of a TV show. Maybe that's why they call it season one. 
Now, this book retails for $19.99, and it has 138 pages. So it collects the first five issues. Let's look at the extras in the back. So here are some other characters you'll see through here, like Shay, Hey, Sheila, and Doc Faraday. There's Killian. It's interesting that he's right after all those other characters. Hardly. You get some sketches back here. The layouts to some other rooms. Yeah, see, Magistrate. Interesting that there's ads right here and then a couple of more pinups over here. So, this one again, $19.99. And Patrick O'Leaf, who I didn't even mention, who did Untold Tales of Spider-Man. And the intro is really sweet. It talks about how Patrick O'Leaf is the reason he came back to comics. Is he wanted to work with his friend again. Uh, they developed a friendship when he was first working in comics. So that's really cool. So again, this is Edge World Season 1. Or Volume 1, A Little Chaos in Your Life. 12% Dread. Now this one, I had a hard time reading. Not because of the premise, or the writing, or the story, or anything. But because... Um, well, I'm going to show you. Uh, this one retails for $29.99. And it has 416 pages. Uh, this is the one that I had to put on my progressives. My... That's what they're called. <laughs> we used to call them readers. Some people call them bifocals. But... The font was so small, and the book is already smaller than the other one, so it's smaller than the trim size for a trade paperback, that I was like, oh, man, oh, I don't want to... I hate admitting I'm getting older, or admitting I'm getting older, and this is a book that showed me. I'm like, okay, I guess I need to just come to terms with it. All right, so this is written by Emily McGovern. It is a super quick read for 416 pages, and it's a really interesting read, it, and it's funny... And it's done in a really unique, holy crap, I think this is what people are going through these days. And I think that's the best way to put it. So in here, it's the story of three different ladies. And it's a little bit of a slow burn, but when you get to about two-thirds of it, you start to see where it's escalating to and how it's going to aim, like, where it heads in a chaotic kind of way. So you have three different ladies, this is all set in London, and they all are dealing with their own work situation, while this is also offering a social commentary on the role that technology plays in our lives, how connected we are, especially when the phone is not charged and you're late for an interview. So we meet the character of Emma, who works at the world's biggest tech company, it's Arco, and they just launched their new health app. So that's what she does for a living. She was forced to release it early, even though there's a bunch of bugs that still needed to be fixed. Anybody that has ever worked in IT knows exactly what she's going through. And even though she's engaged, she has feelings for one of her coworkers. And then we meet her best friend, Katie, who doesn't have the luck that Emma does. She is kind of in and out of work and it ends up getting a dream job pretty much as a tutor to a super rich family and it's all connected to Arco and she's in this fake relationship with Nas who is her ex but still needs them to appear like they're together to get a visa now that's the part that brought a lot of comedy into this particular book because she's the type of character that it can't land a job, of course, because she doesn't have a working visa for anybody that doesn't know what that is. It's a passport that allows you to work in a specific country and you have to get it either approved. There's some people, yeah, end up in relationships and get married. And she, that's what she's trying to do. And she's trying to find an official job. This is what the artwork looks like. This is what the panel layouts look like. It is very cartoony. Um, but it is really funny in the way that it made me realize there is a big division between generations and how invasive technology has become in our lives there's a big social commentary like i mentioned especially with the character of nas if you've ever known anybody that's waiting around on a visa to work and how do they make money until then and what happens what is their future like so there is some seriousness to this and like i said it goes in a really interesting way i really enjoyed this book i wasn't expecting to like it just because i'm not that connected to social media or that connected to my phone uh, but I see my daughters, like all their friends have phones and my daughters are 10 and 13. And it's crazy to me to see all their friends on their phones. Now, I don't have my kids. Everybody raises their kids differently. 
and I'm sure I'll break and buy my oldest a phone. She's a teenager now. Uh, next year when she goes to Chicago on a field trip with her friends. But, you know, it's just really strange to me because that's not the life I had. And it made me realize there is a huge generational gap between us. And this is all they've known all their lives. So when you see characters here talking and having conversations with other people, meanwhile, thinking about what their phone and like and submit that they haven't sent. See, I'm talking social media nonsense right now. But that's what it makes you realize. So... That's what this is. There's really no extras except for like three pages of sketchbooks, which are tiny. And that's it. A little behind the scenes of that part. But this book retails for $29.99 and has 416 pages. Much like 12% Dread, this was a really quick read. And this is here, much like 12% Dread, this was a really quick read. Unlike 12% Dread, this is a different type of story. This is all written by Matt Kent, and you have the artwork here of Tyler Jenkins, who does the art and the uh, lettering here. So this is a really interesting story about a couple of people that are trying to find this mystical uh, treasure in Vietnam. It was all a it was a general's treasure from the Japanese War during World War II and he wanted to hide it in Vietnam. So this guy right here, his name is the Apache Delivery Service, even though he's Navajo and loves to correct people. He gets drafted to go and find this treasure. Now this is Ernie Ness, that's his real name. He gets drafted by this gentleman to go and find this particular treasure. Now I wish I could have read this during the month of October. Uh, no, actually I did read this in October, I just didn't get a chance to make a video. Because this is such a good little quick horror read. Uh, it is a jungle horror story because the treasure, of course, is guarded by a group of witches that have been living in this cave for what people say thousands of years. And now these two characters are going deep into the jungle to try to get into the mystery. One of them, of course, doesn't believe in witches. And the other one still has some doubts, even though he's seen some things in his past. Uh, and little by little, they become paranoid about getting closer and closer to this particular treasure. And then, of course, you throw in this uh, serial killer that is hunting them down, and you got yourself a hell of a horror story. This one is a quick read. Like I mentioned, $19.99, and it has 128 pages. All the way in the back, we have some variants and sketches, character designs. That's an awesome freaking variant right there. And more variants and then this is your sketchbook right there ernie and the different characters that show up through here the paper stock on this one is this thick glossy paper and this is apache delivery service i love this cover did you know the author um not gonna pronounce it correctly hideyuki kikuchi started writing Vampire Hunter D novels in 1983. Oh my gosh. It was like 83, 84. Total of 40 books across like 53 volumes or something like that. Um, so Dark Horse has collected them in these Omni formats with the first three books for volume one. And I think there are three books in uh, book two as well. So just as a comparison, here is my very worn copy of the first book. And the, uh, here, on the spines, when Dark Horse printed these years ago, look, it's like the splatter. And then they started using the uh, horse there. However, so there's um, a size comparison. It's the same small digest size, except humongous. So I would say expect um, some, you know, the spine being worn like that this one is in better condition right there there's a worn spine um so yeah hardcover would be definitely awesome however maybe they're seeing if these sell because um there are a lot of books to collect and they would have to you know i suppose pare down the size if you wanted the hardcover but that's just me guessing all right so why is this so awesome this um is Translated by Kevin Leahy. 
and he must do a fantastic job. So, okay, so not only is the author Kikuchi like amazing with word choice and syntax, and that's like sentence structure and such, the 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 uh the translator has to be excellent at it as well, right? I, I'm gonna stop you right here. Are you telling me this is not a comic book? Do, do, do. Is that a yes? Yes? There's yes, no yes. comics? But there are pictures by Yoshitaku Amano in here. But mm -hmm. Those are words! I know words! That's wait, a book! Wait, where's, where's the... You're trying to trick me into reading a book! There you go. Woo! Look at that! So this is <laughs> done from the left to right format because mm -hmm. it is a prose. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for pointing that out, Uncanny Omar. All these books are a combo of horror and fantasy and sci-fi set in the future and... Kikuchi like just balances that so well. Oh, you guys remember that part in the movie? So the first movie, Vampire Hunter D in the 80s, is based on the first book, and the second movie is based on the third book. Anyway, let me read to you a couple of paragraphs where just to show his great uh talent at describing things. The man quickly alighted from the driver's seat. His whole body was like a coiled spring. He even moved like a beast. Before he could reach for the passenger door, the silver handle turned and the door opened from the inside. A deep chill and the stench of blood suddenly shrouded the refreshing breeze. As Dee caught a glimpse of the figure stepping down from the carriage, the slightest hue of emotion stirred in his eyes. A woman. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a question mark. A woman? Now, for me, personally, fantasy books usually get too much into detail and the authors describe and I kind of get bored. This is the perfect balance. All right, and here's an example of how Kikuchi writes fights that are easy to, at least for me, imagine in my head. Three flashes of black shot from his right hip. One flew over Dee's head, arced, and came at him from the rear. One zipped right along the ground, clipping every blade of grass it touched until it turned up at his feet and shot toward his armpit. And one came straight at the hunter as a distraction. Each was a strike blade unleashed on a different course with breathtaking speed. So if you're not familiar with Vampire Hunter D, um, it's pretty simple. His name is D. You find out later what that stands for. And he hunts vampires. Like in the first book, he's helping out um, this woman who was bit by a vampire and she's hiring him to hunt him. And he's got super amazing fighting skills and, and you know, he's just such a cool taciturn character that always wins. I highly recommend this. Each book has over 500 pages. It only retails for $19.99. Joy Operations. So this is the latest work by Brian Michael Bendis. This collects issues one through five of the miniseries. Uh, it's a Jinx World and Dark Horse collab. So Brian Michael Bendis is joined by Stephen Byrne and the lettering is Joshua Reed. This is a really interesting book and this is a fun book. Again, I don't really judge people on what they've written before. Uh, this is a interesting book because it's a different type of character. We know he's r written some strong female leads. Uh, he's written Jessica Drew, Alias, Jessica Jones, and you know brought in a lot of female characters to the Avengers and put them in the foreground. This here feels like a different type of character for him to be writing because... Uh, so we meet the uh, character of Joy. This is Joy Corrigan. She's a special agent envoy, if you will, of the Jonando Trust. So they're corporate owned cities that are pretty much the centerpiece of this futuristic world and her job is just to right the wrongs uh for the for the trust now what's interesting about this is that joy the whole time it has a narrative like you know because it's bendis so you're used to narratives like that by the way this is another one that has mature themes and strong language and the whole time you're reading about this, I, I had no idea what this is about. I like going into books completely blind and no one was talking about this book. But it's really cool because, you know, she keeps talking to herself. And then you realize, wait, she's not talking to herself. It's a voice inside her head because at one time it comments, are you really just going to keep pretending you can't hear me? My dog's going crazy because the mailman is here. Uh, but I thought, wait, where is this going? So she has this voice in her head that she's hearing and the voice is telling her about this corruption that's going on, who she shouldn't trust and, you know, these relationships she's got. So it's a lot of her talking to herself and again, strong language. But if she's not talking to herself, there's Catherine right there. 
Uh, this is all glued binding, so you do get a little bit of gutter loss. Uh, Catherine plays an important part. I'm going to show you some of the art right here. But I thought that was a twist I didn't see coming. I just thought, okay, she's this secret agent. She's a little bit older than his typical characters, and I thought that was unique enough. But the fact that this voice kept uh, kept talking to her, and she doesn't know who it is, and then eventually the voice introduces uh, herself or himself to her, uh, says that they've met before. And they go by Hammond. I like this uh, family that she has. Not Hammond, I'm sorry, Hampton. And that is a famous phrase of hers, just shut the F up. But that's what this is. So there's this whole mystery about who to trust, how to save your family. Let me show you this awesome art right here, though. It's in this particular issue. I absolutely love this. I think this is so easy to follow. There are no words. It's just action shot after action shot. Reminds me of the hallway scene in all, um, Old Boy. Although, Joey doesn't really get tired because you know she's some kind of superhero. And then this is the kind of action and art you're going to be seeing. So, it's really cool. It's kind of like anime, absolutely. It reminds me a little bit of like Ghost in the Shell, Paprika, things like that. You don't know what's real, what isn't, who exactly is Hampton. But, I enjoyed this now the book has 152 pages this one retails for 24 dollars 99 cents all the way in the back are the variant covers by different artists like christian ward right there michael avon oming the clan shalvey david marquez alex malief and then you have the sketchbook right here all the different phases that steven was gonna draw joy in not just joy but also catherine at one time catherine was a little bit younger the design for the Hatamoto. And then the backgrounds, of course. Gorgeous artwork. This one really stood out to me. And here's what all the spines of these books look like. So if you want to pause right here, it's a great way to pause. Or, no. It's a great time to remind you to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. Get a closer look at that 12% dread. There we go. And don't forget Vampy D. Oh, yes. Come on. You come on, on over here. Let me get these out of the way for you. Bam. There we go. I think it would have been cool if they like made a, a picture go across the spines. However, I get that. I mean, you've got Yashitaka Obano artwork. You want to make it wrap around to get the whole uh, beautiful picture in there. There's Melanie's two cents. Extra two cents for you. We have Demons, another book I wish I had gotten out a video of in October. I read this while I was at New York Comic Con. Holy crap, this was so good. Uh, this is Scott Snyder reunited with Greg Capullo, coming from the pages of Batman. It's been a while since they've worked together. Both of them have been doing their own things. Um, and of course, uh, Dark Knight, not Dark Knight, I'm sorry, Death Metal and Metal. But this is their independent work right here, collecting issues one through three. Now, the less I say about this one, the better, but I feel like I have to give you a, 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 a elevator pitch, if you will. So we start off with this character right here of Lamb, and you find out that she's named after an angel. She's named after the ancient angel, Lamasu. Now, she's here talking to some neighbors. They seem like a lovely couple. Uh, she has an arm that looks like a robotic arm, and she's holding what looks to be an, an axe. And the book is called We Have Demons. So uh, another one I had no idea uh, going into what it was. We see a flashback of her with her dad 14 years ago in Florida. And what seems like for no reason, her dad chops off her arm. So it's pretty brutal. Like uh, Another one that's definitely mature content. Now, we find out that he chopped her arm off because she had been bitten by a copperhead. And the poison was going to travel through her body so he had to chop her arm off but still he seemed pretty calm to be doing it and it looked like you know it definitely was leading you a different path now you're going to see through here that he kept calling her dilla and that was short for armadillo because he said that she had like an armor of god we find out that he's a preacher we find out that you know he raised her by himself until uh she, she he ends up getting married again to june which is lamb's um sixth grade teacher now throughout this we see some flashbacks we still haven't gotten to her when she's older sitting next to the neighbors so here 
Uh, she, you know, she, she gets to find out more and more about her dad, and then they grow kind of distant when she gets older because he keeps making adjustments to her arm, he keeps giving in to her, and he wa she wants to know more about her father, what he does. She ends up finding a journal, she ends up finding clothes that are bloody, he goes on these trips, and he's like, oh, it's for the church. And she grows distant. So by the time she went and got out of high school, she kind of just stopped talking to him. I love this because this has kind of become a meme. She stopped talking to him until she gets a call. She gets a call from her stepmom saying that her dad had passed. So she goes to the funeral. She speaks at the funeral. This is a really sweet part of the book where she talks about how she doesn't really remember even what she said. So she doesn't understand what kind of person her father was and she never got answers now that he's gone. So she gets upset and takes off the arm that he made her, the one that says God girl, she was he was a preacher. And then she was throwing it, of course, she opens up a secret chamber. So when she goes down there, she's like, what the hell is this? Again, I wish I didn't have to talk about this, but this is just a small pitch. And this is where her stepmother comes in because she sees all these photos of dead people, this axe right there. What's going on? Who was her father? And then June walks down there, her stepmom, and she's like, Lamb, your father had a lot of secrets. And she finds out the truth. Well, according to her dad and also June, that he was a demon hunter. That there are real demons walking the earth. And it was his job to go and hunt them down. With the help of Gus. Now, you don't know who Gus is, and I don't want to tell you what's behind the door. And I don't want to tell you if demons are real, but come on, look at that cover. And are the neighbors demons? Is that is that what's going on here? Or are they aliens? Are they being possessed? What's, what's going on? One way to find out. I had a lot of fun with this book. This is another one that's a quick read. Let's look at the extras in the back. We have some variant covers back here. This book retails for $19.99, and it has 143 pages. Lots of variants. We have demons bonus section right here. This is the script and the rough outline for issue number one. So you get all of that for the people that want to ever make it into comics to see what the script looks like. We have original pages here with inked pages. And then this is the different logo process right here by Emma Price. More script. And I think you get a little bit more yeah, art back here. So this is We Have Demons, and strongly suggest checking it out, especially if you like Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's artwork. I'm actually surprised this was not released in a hardcover format. Next up is another Bendis book. This one is called Goldfish. This one retails for $19.99, and it has 288 pages. This goes back long ago. This goes back to his indie days at Caliber Press. So this collects AKA Goldfish, Act, Joker, King, Queen, and Jack. So all four of the acts are collected in here. Mature themes for sure. And this goes back so far that this is a uh, his art during this particular time. Uh, he was drawing and writing. Because a lot of people forget that Bendis also has some art behind or under his belt rather. So this is definitely a noir crime book. And this has been collected already in the Noir Omnibus that was printed over at Marvel. And since, since it's part of the Jinx world, Bendis owns that and he can take it wherever he wants to get printed. And now it's Dark Horse. So this particular character of Goldfish, we're introduced, uh, comes back home pretty much. And that's what this is. It's a revenge story about coming back home. Uh, and again, this is Bendis, the same guy that did daredevil he wrote x-men and he wrote avengers and of course he wrote some crime stuff like powers and torso yeah uh, just to name a few and this is one of the grittiest comics that he's done especially talking about things like torso it's a revenge story so we have this grifter that returns back home he goes by the name of goldfish his real name is david gold but everybody calls him goldfish and he goes back home to the city and when he returns to the city, he sees that Lauren, his ex-lover and partner, is now the big crime boss. While Goldfish is still out there doing some small-time cons, and his friend is now some kind of detective. But the reason he came back to the city 
is not really a MacGuffin, but it's to bring back his child. He wants to take his kid out of the city. He wants to leave the city with his kid. Um, this is dark. Not just in means of the way that the artwork looks, but in the way that the story is written. This goes places that it, it was rough to read at times. Uh, just because, you know, if you're not in a good place, sometimes a dark story can really bring you down. Uh, so if you... It, there, there's a lot of things here that happen in real life, and I realize that. But some people need an escape from that. And if you're looking for some gritty, noir, crime stuff that happens in the real world, look no further than this. I mean, this is no different than things like Sin City, per se. So if you enjoy Sin City, then that's the kind of story this is. But I do like to warn people ahead of time, you know, if you can't stand the thought of kids getting hurt or anything like that, then definitely this is not for you. Um, it is not a quick read. There is actually a lot of dialogue in this. I think people have heard me, let me show you for example. People have heard me talk about the Bendis talking heads. Um, so there's so much dialogue in here. Of course, I picked the wrong pages uh, to look at that whenever Goldfish and Lauren talk sometimes, it becomes kind of like a script or a prose novel that there is no art. It just kind of shows you the script, what they're going through. And it does it for a few pages, and it does it a couple of times. So, you know, be prepared to do some reading. Now, as, as far as the extras in the back, you have the original pitch right here. This was presented to Caliber Press that he both wrote and drew. Kind of like a trailer. The pro story back here. This is where he became friends with David Mack. And then some ads and posters right here. 1991 to 1992, so this came out a long time ago when he was trying to break it big into comics. And look where he is now. But the book has 288 pages and retails for $19.99. If you want to see Bendis at his most indie, I think this is the one. Usagi Ojimbo Saga Volume 5. Now, this is the latest printing. This has been printed previously before. Uh, this one here retails for $29.99. And it has 588 pages. I believe that is a new cover. I have the hard covers of these. Uh, but this is a new cover for the soft cover. This is dedicated to Hank and Nancy Kagawa. And here are the table of contents, the cast of characters. I love when they do that. Uh, the introduction of each story. Introductions by people like John Landis. You know, there's also comic creators that do the introductions. But so cool to see that. Uh, here's your cast of characters, Miyamoto Usagi, Tomoe, which feels like this book is mainly focused on Tomoe. And I love this series. This is kind of a little bit of the slowdown period for me. Uh, but here we have a bunch of stories that lead up to a reunion of Usagi and Tomoe. And it's like him spending a lot of time in the Geishu province. So eventually they're going to run into each other. Now, one of the stories in here, I think this is really setting what's going to happen later on. But one of the stories in here is about Jay. And Jay's a character, of course, you're going to know Jay shows up because of this right here. Uh, Jay's a character that is like the black sword of God. But he appears in this dreams and nightmare story where we have this lady right here dreaming or rather having a nightmare about jay and she's like who are you and he's just sitting there smiling and he's like i am your destiny and she's like i make my own destiny and then eventually the sword that she's holding in her hand because she stabs him gets taken over kind of like a symbiote and then she gets taken over now she gets woken up um from this nightmare that she's having by her nephew who's asking for help and then she now wears a smile on her face. So you know that Jay has now, well, you know, you can't really get rid of him. And maybe he's developed the ability to possess bodies. So pretty interesting. Uh, so it does feature a tale of Jay Kitsune here. Uh, also features a tale of Inspector Ishida. And I'm sure you probably saw the bounty hunter again right there. Let me see if I find him. Yeah, right here in this particular star, uh, story right here, again in the dog. But the main focus of this is the story of Tomoe. 
And it seems like that's what he's doing. He is developing her character. And it focuses more on her. I love that his art is constantly evolving. Like, it never fails to impress. He's never phoning in any of these stories. And the backgrounds and the set, like the settings, which is different than just backgrounds. Uh, the clothing, it's just amazing. But, yeah, it's a high quality story with a high quality art to it. So, there is one particular story in here. It's the second story, so this isn't much of a uh, spoiler or anything, but it's the Mother of Mountain story. And it's interesting to see both him and Tomoe just become enslaved by her cousin, who has a secret, of course, uh, Noriko, who enslaves both of them until there is a slave uprising, of course, caused by these characters. And then when she succumbs to the cave, because she's... You know, they're spoiling her plan with the caves. And I thought that, that was a really good story. So you get to see the origin of Tomoe through Tomoe's story. And this collects um, issues 76 through 93, as well as the Usagi Yojimbo color special 1 through 3. And all the covers, by the way, everything is in black and white, with the exception of, well, the covers. The gallery right here, here's the cover art for these different issues. So these are all in color. And then there is the color special right there. Love that one. Sakai oh. does those particular pieces of art. And then Toma's original story, The Doors and Foxfire, right here. And then we have some pinups all the way in the back. And this is uh, Stan Sakai's contribution to the 2004 San Diego Comic-Con catalog. Which, in this was included in the catalog. And then you have the pinups right here of different artists. Uh, one day we'll get some more mouse guard. And then a little bit about the author. This is the soft cover version, but in case you missed it, it is back in print. BPRD Hell on Earth Volume 5. That's it. This is where it all comes to an end. We have Sledgehammer here, Varvara, a couple other characters I can't talk about, but this is where everything comes to an end with the mythical Ogdru Jihad waking up. So the dragon is now awake, and it's going to bring about the end of the world. You have an introduction here from the phenomenal John Arcudi, who spent a lot longer than just a few issues writing... Hellboy. I think it was a total of 12 years. So this particular series, Hell on Earth, leads directly into The Devil You Know. But it definitely ends this particular era. Uh, so in here you have the character, actually Johan right here. This story is so awesome of Johan Cross. And it's a dark story. And this one, I believe it's Peter, um, oh what is his name? Peter Snedgeberg, oh my gosh, he, he drew Starman. I cannot remember, but it's Nowhere, Nothing, Never. And it's mainly focusing on the character of Johan. Now, you're going to see other characters in here. Uh, you're going to see the character of Liz. This is really hard to talk about without going into detail as to what this is. Uh, but not everybody makes it out. Not everybody, not all the characters make it out of this one. There's a lot of sacrifices that are made in this particular uh, volume. This is uh, $29.99. It has been collected in hardcover format before, uh, but this is the first time it's been collected in uh, softcover. It has the same page count, the same extras, 416 pages. So you're going to see familiar characters through these pages, like Liz Sherman and Dr. Kate Corrigan, Iosif, and a couple of other special characters, Sledgehammer, make a particular return. Now, this collects volumes 12, 13, and 15. Uh, if you've seen my reading order of Hellboy, I threw in BPRD, and I'll tell you where to find volume 14. But that's all I'm going to be flipping through here, except for the last arc, the actual finale, the Cometh the Hour. That's all drawn by Lawrence Campbell. I love the fact that they had one artist draw all of that. Now, the extras. There's some sketches, some final art pages here. So original art pages. Some of the cover, the uh, actual process to the covers right there. Original painted artwork. Oh, Mike Mignola. Drawing sledgehammer. I love the thumbnail sketches right here. 
especially to the connecting covers. That's so awesome. Uh, this book is printed in this thick, glossy paper. It's very similar to what they used in the hardcover, honestly. 416 pages, $29.99, and this is the finale of BPRD Hell on Earth. Last but certainly not least, Black Hammer Omnibus Volume 1. Now, one thing I will say about this book is that if you have the library edition, this is the exact same content, except is in a trade paperback form. And of course, a lot cheaper. The library edition is $49.99. This is $29.99. But the extras and the stuff included in here, it's all the same. 408 pages. So really quickly, the description of this, the pitch for this, what makes this story so compelling and awesome is that it, this is definitely a love letter to Golden Age and Silver Age characters. So these group of characters were all taken... Um, well, how do I put this without spoiling it? So it's a group of superheroes that all wake up one day living in this small farmhouse. These characters remember who they are, but don't remember exactly how they got here. So it's a very Twilight Zone-ish feel to it whenever you start off the beginning. You start getting to know the characters little by little, and each one is so freaking awesome. So this first story arc is called Welcome to Black Hammer. And that's what makes this so addicting. It's like reading about Silver Age and Golden Age characters all trapped together in a farmhouse. Can't remember how they all got there. And it's an exploration into the mystery behind the characters is what makes this work. Each one of these characters has either a heartbreaking story or something horrible or some kind of twist with them. So I'm only going to talk about some of the characters in here. And just to kind of give you an idea of who they are. So you have your older gentleman right here. This is Abraham Slamkowski, who is Abraham Slam. So it's like your Captain America. It's, it's like your character of the Phantom or the shadow a character that doesn't have really supernatural abilities he's just really good at fighting going knuckle to knuckle with villains and he's aging um the other character i wanted to talk about though who is one of my favorite characters is this character right here of gail gibbons that is golden gail and golden gail was a little girl kind of like uh, captain marvel or shazam whenever she wants to turn into golden gail she yells out the name so she's a little girl and she yells out, Shazam. Or, I'm sorry, she yells out a magical word <laughs> and turns into Golden Gale. However, she's aging. So every time that she's Golden Gale, she reverts back to the age that she's supposed to be. So she goes, you know, from being a little girl to a teenager to a woman to somebody that's older. And it's really sad to see her because she ages and she's like, I don't want to turn into a little girl anymore. It's really weird. However, when she becomes an old woman, she's like, okay, you know what? I look forward to turning into a little girl because my bones hurt. I'm so tired of feeling so tired. And it's that kind of beauty that you explore within each of these characters. There's also freaking Colonel Weird. Oh, he's so awesome. He's like uh, Adam Strange, except like mixed with like Doctor Strange and if they had succumbed and gone crazy, if they had seen the things that they had seen in the real life and just gone crazy. You have uh, Barbalian here who has a heartbreaking story about being accepted. Uh, t uh, talkie Walkie, Madam Dragonfly. Uh, Madam Dragonfly is like your uh, crypt keeper, if you will. So, I mean, it knows what it is. This is such a really cool story. There's a bunch of spinoffs that are based on this. And it's just such a revolutionary story that it, it made it into my favorite Dark Wars comics of all time. I believe I made that video two years ago, and it still stands to this day. There are a bunch of spin-offs of these, and I believe there's three of these um, and three of World of Black Hammer hardcovers. This collects the first and second volume of Black Hammer and then the Black Hammer giant-sized annual. And it's a beautiful story with a lot of twists and turns. And there's so many mysteries, and I mean, I just barely covered any of it. It's so good. So if you've not read it, do yourself a favor and read it. it, it check out this. Dean Ornstrom does the, I believe he does the first volume, if I'm not mistaken. Definitely has a Jeff Lemire feel to his art. I feel like Jeff Lemire wanted to draw 
this book, but just could not because of all the other commitments he had. Uh, this one, again, $29.99, 408 pages. And that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in any of these books, check out our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with a kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And those were the recent collected editions from Dark Horse. Let us know in the comments of any of them interest to you if you plan on picking them up if you hope that one day they'll release a hardcover of vampire hunter d or a big omnibus library edition of the bprd stuff i'm really surprised we have demons didn't come out in hardcover either uh, but yes if you have any questions comments leave them down below check out our patreon and spread shop amazing ways to support the channel and more importantly everyone stay minty stay healthy and safe out there much love